we are just naturally, we're going to be a bit more insulin resistant at night. If we've been on that roller coaster since the morning or at any point in the day, we're going to, you know, we're just kind of chasing that blood sugar crash and kind of that rise and crash. And the other thing I see too, kind of paired with that is going to be cortisol levels, like wired and tired. They just haven't calmed down the way that they should. And then also circadian deregulation where we're just not getting enough sunlight during the day. And we are watching Netflix in front of a big TV screen in the evening. It's usually, I think, a trifecta of all three. And, you know, each of them are working against the, uh, against us in their own way. And so, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can help to mitigate that. But I think that's often what's going on. For so many listeners that are in their like mid to late 30s, early 40s, and are trying to make sense of a constellation of symptoms, let's talk about, and I'm going to put it in air quotes because it's not pejorative, warning signs of perimenopause, because I, I still think that there's a lack of understanding. There's a lack of education by a lot of healthcare professionals. There are many of us that are doing a great job around this, but many others who don't really prepare their patients and their clients for what is to come. So in your experience, what are some of the big warning signs that maybe get overlooked or women are gaslit? You know, probably the number one being weight loss resistance. It's like, you know, you're 40. Maybe this is just the way things are. That's certainly what I heard. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Just infuriating. <laughs> <clears throat> well, let's start with some of it because it's a, you know, again, this is a journey. It's a continuum um, that can last sorry, ladies, you know, 10 plus years. And so in, in a lot of ways, it can be gradual for some, not so much. Um, but because as you know, natural menopause can happen anywhere between 45 and 55 years old. That means that perimenopause, which is the transitional period to that one defining moment, that one day that you haven't had a period for, for 12 months, um, it, it, it is a process. It is a journey. And I really, I call it a reckoning <laughs> in so many ways. Um, but that means that some of us can start to experience warning signs or symptoms as early as our mid to late thirties. And what I'll normally see in the beginning, you know, often they'll say that your period stops or your period's changing. And, and that's a lot of what the literature indicates that perimenopause, one of those signs of perimenopause is that you just have irregular periods. And I wish I wish that's all that there was, but I rarely have ever had a woman come to me and say, I think I'm in perimenopause because my periods are becoming irregular. No, there's always symptoms that come up right before or many years prior to even when your, your menstrual cycle begins to shift and become more irregular. So those early signs and warning signs, I guess, in terms of peri are often in relation to the low progesterone. That was definitely for me. Um, I, that's what I noticed out the gate. I'm like, what is this? And, um, for many of us, that'll often be in that, that luteal phase, that late luteal phase when that's when we have progesterone and it's that late luteal phase where our PMS symptoms, you know, are, are there, but then I find that they get kind of amplified. So women will notice a lack of stress resilience, all of a sudden things that they could handle, they're not able to handle as well. Um, they find themselves just a little bit more or maybe a lot more irritated than they used to be. Um, maybe noticing other mood changes like more anxiety, more depression, more rage called the perimenopausal rage, um, sleep issues. And, and yeah, and you start to notice that weight resistance, the bloating that begins to happen towards the end of that, that second week of the luteal phase. So those will be some of the early warning signs I'll notice for women in perimenopause. And then as time goes on, symptoms begin to really ratchet up. And so women will start to notice a lack of word recall, um, a lack of alertness, more fatigue, especially in the middle of the day, they'll begin to notice the weight resistance, as you've mentioned, all of a sudden, even if the scale doesn't move there, the, the fat has relocated, you know, to the belly and, and not where it used to be. And so, and it's not as easy as it used to be. They may notice themselves less strong, um, and that they're losing muscle mass. And then obviously some of the more kind of what I consider to be really overt symptoms like palpitations and itchy ears, itchy scalp, um, again, like severe low energy. We start to notice a, of a slew of symptoms as they move into that second phase of perimenopause, the late perimenopause, where estradiol and progesterone are beginning to drop. Estradiol is also wildly fluctuating. You know, it's really interesting to me because this it, it's 
if you look at the way estrogen is distributed over the course of perimenopause, we have some of the most wild fluctuations of our entire lifetime. And it does that for a while. And then toward the latter stage of perimenopause, things kind of drop off a cliff. And what I find so interesting is that most of what I experienced as a woman uh, was magnified times 10. You know, I, I had those crime scene periods. I had trouble sleeping. I was weight loss resistant. But all those quirky things that your dermatologist will just give you a steroid cream for, mm. like, you know, the skin itchiness. And, and a colleague of mine just reached out the other day and said, she has seen five specialists for itchy skin. And I finally said, does anyone talk to you about estrogen? And she said, no. And she said, I'm going to go, I'm going to ask for a prescription immediately because I'm tired of being itchy inside my ears. You mentioned the scalp, but she said her entire body is just itchy and she's done everything. So I think it's both reassuring for individuals if they're experiencing these symptoms, but also for those who have yet to have gotten to that point where they're experiencing symptoms, letting them know that our perimenopausal journey is so governed, I think, by lifestyle the yes. choices that we make in lifestyle that can either magnify or can reduce some of the symptoms that we are expected to experience. And so this is where I think talking to patients about nutrition is like one example, because I know that for me, I had crazy cravings. There was a video I did that I just stumbled upon. There was a Halloween where I was just handing out candy and I think I ate 20, 20, 20. Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cups, like the small ones. Were they mini? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. But I was like, I felt That's terrible. But I, I thought to myself, what is going on that I feel mm. compelled to eat that much sugar? And so maybe we can segue into talking about the lifestyle piece that is so important at this stage of life. So the cravings, like I had crazy sugar cravings, which more often than not, can be uh, amplification of the need for adrenal support. Yes. And do you find that many of your patients experience either salt or sugar or carb cravings? And how do you help them investigate what the root cause is of some of these concerns and symptoms? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, insulin resistance, which I think can be a driver of that, but also again, you know, a deregulated stress response system due to lower levels of, of not only progesterone, but then, you know, wonky cortisol levels as well. I think are all driving this. I wish I could say it was one thing. Yeah. I mean, women always ask me, what's the thing? And I'm like, it's probably a multitude of things. It's also probably the amount of obligation that you're signed up for the amount of caring for everybody you are doing the, you know, the lack of sleep that you're getting at night, because you're trying to get everything done that you didn't get a chance to do that day. And so, um, you know, lifestyle is probably the, the most critical foundation that we can sit on. I know that there's a lot of conversation around hormone replacement therapy right now as the magic bullet. Um, but you know, these hormones are powerful optimizers and they only work really, really well when our lifestyle is really, you know, beautifully kind of curated to work in our favor. And so nutrition is always a big, big piece when I'm, when I'm having a conversation with women about how do we create, you know, great metabolic health? How do we create great uh, metabolic energy? And so for me, that always starts with, you know, making sure that we're hitting our protein needs that we're getting. I try to aim. I always tell women to aim for about 40 grams of protein in the morning, you know, that not only to feel, you know, to feel satated, but also to have energy for the day and to address those cravings. I also know that how we set the tone for our day in the morning is going to affect the rest of our day, even into the next day, particularly around our blood sugar. And if you want to jump on that blood sugar roller coaster, there's no better way to do that than with a, you know, a more carb or sugar driven, you know, breakfast. Um, but a lot of people don't know is that what you eat in the morning is going to shift your blood sugar for up to 48 hours. I've seen it on continuous glucose monitors over and over again. Like you want your fasting glucose to be back to that baseline, it's going to take a couple of days to recover from that more sugary carb driven breakfast. So kicking off your day with protein and fiber and healthy fats, I think is one of the most important ways that we can support women. And particularly in, in midlife, I think that that, that way of kicking off our morning is critical. And I have a lot of other habits that I love for the morning, but I always loved a quote by Louise Hay that uses that says, you know, how you live your life is how you start your day. 
Oh, that's perfect. And I think for a lot of people, it's kind of finding this reframe. It's not that we're coming at these changes from a place of lack. It's just helping them build components into their lifestyle that are sustainable long term, like not as a quick fix, fix, but as something that is long term and sustainable. And, you know, you and I certainly grew up in the time when, you know, fat was bastardized, we feared fat, you know, everything was carb carbohydrate centric, and there's healthy carbs, and then there's processed carbs. And so we're yes, talking about two about different things. Carbs, yes. Yeah. And, and it's not that carbohydrates are bad. I think that for a lot of people, it's finding that reframe of really leaning into protein, because if listeners don't already know this, because you probably have heard me say it a thousand times, we start losing muscle mass as we get into our forties. And this can show up in different ways. It can concurrently with this, the changes and fluctuations of estrogen or estradiol, we can get changes in insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity and helping people understand that consuming adequate amounts of protein is not just going to keep you satiated, keep your blood sugar stable, but is also going to help you go on to build and maintain muscle. And the fun fact that I love always interjecting is that we develop insulin resistance in our muscles first. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an aesthetics thing. It really is metabolic currency. It is important for metabolic health. One of our good friends, Dr. Casey has a book that's out today, Good Energy, really focusing in on metabolic health and metabolic health crisis. And so I love that you wove into that conversation a bit about the protein piece. So listeners may be listening and they're like, I like my oatmeal. I like my French toast or I like my pancakes. And there's always healthy fixes for just about everything. So I remind people, if you if you love oatmeal and that's something that you desire, there's ways to make it healthier. It might be smaller portions, um, protein pancakes. I always say, you know, mm -hmm. you can make that with whey protein. If you tolerate that, you can add more eggs. Um, I used to, when I tolerated dairy, I used to actually make a pancake air quotes with whey protein, a little bit of banana and an egg. And it was very, it was more protein heavy and not nearly as sugary. And that was the way I worked around that. So there's always a workable solution to just about everything that you love to make it healthier for you. What are your thoughts on women that are not consuming enough protein who find that they want to eat everything and anything in their pantry at nine o'clock at night? What does that really speak to? So if women are, are listening and they're like, well, I'm trying to eat more protein, but I have a lot of cravings at night. What can that be a sign of? Mm. You know, a couple things that come up for me is one, you know, blood sugar deregulation is a big one here. Insulin resistance. We are just naturally, we're going to be a bit more insulin resistant at night. And, um, and if we've been on that roller coaster since the morning or at any point in the day, we're going to, you know, we're just kind of chasing that blood sugar crash and kind of that rise and crash. And the other thing I see too, kind of paired with that is going to be, you know, cortisol levels, like wired and tired. Um, they just haven't calmed down the way that they should. And then also circadian deregulation, um, where we're just not getting enough sunlight during the day. And we are watching Netflix in front of a big TV screen in the evening, or we're just not giving our, ourselves the opportunity to fiercely protect our, our sleep routine. So those it's usually, I think a trifecta of all three and, you know, each of them are working against the, uh, against us in their own way. Day, but you combine the three of them. And honestly, how do you even stand a chance at that point? And so, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can help to mitigate that. Um, and I can share some of those, but I think that's often what's going on. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that um, I, I sometimes will say that if you feel like you finish a meal and you aren't satiated, the question is, is it because of the macros you put together? I usually say, if you eat enough protein, you should be full ideally. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's the right types of carbohydrates. And I think, unfortunately, a message that has become the norm is that everyone needs to be low carb or keto. And that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. And I'm in the yeah. midst of working my way through a microbiome course. And the big takeaway that I've taken from the microbiome course thus far and, and relevant to listeners is that particular to women, if you are, if you don't have a healthy gut microbiome and you're eating copious amounts of fats in particular saturated fat, which is in and of itself is not an unhealthy thing. You get that in meat and, and other things um, like coconut oil, but if you're consuming copious amounts of fat and you have an unhealthy gut microbiome, it can make it 
harder for your body to actually heal the gut. And and without going down a rabbit hole and talking about things that will take us completely off course, focusing on perimenopause, I think it's important for listeners to do a little bit of N of one, you know, finding out like where their sweet spot is. This is where I think sometimes if we're looking at carbohydrates specifically, it's really thinking about what is your carbohydrate threshold? And it might be a little different for each one of us. Yeah. Do you find that you're using um, glucometers and continuous glucose monitors quite a bit to help All your female patients figure out like where their tolerance is? It's so rare that I am not putting a CGM on someone. I mean, I have to, I, you know, I'm always, anytime I'm running labs, I'm running a full lipid panel, inflammatory panel. I'm looking at homocysteine. I'm looking at fiber. I'm looking at everything, but I'm looking at fasting insulin, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C. And I'm just seeing if there's, you know, how that looks. And it's so rare, especially women in midlife where, you know, something isn't moving in an unfavorable direction. And so, and when women are struggling, mostly are coming to to me with weight resistance, along with a lot of other things, but that's the one thing that they would really love to get under control, mainly because they know that it's associated with the unfavorable lipids and blood sugar and things that they're seeing on their lab or their C reactive protein is just higher than, than they would love to see. So a lot of that's inflammatory weight. And again, it's the microbiome as well. All of this is playing a role. And so I want them to have that moment where they get to see how is sleep impacting their blood sugar. I always feel like, you know, knowing, I think it's important as important to know your blood sugar numbers as it's to know how much money you've got in the bank. Like, cause, because it's so much of our lifestyle is going to show up on that continuous glucose monitor, you running around to get to a meeting, it's going to show up what you ate for breakfast, it's going to show up, you know, what you ate for dinner and what time you ate dinner, it's going to show up. You'll know your, your, you know, fasting, you'll know your blood sugar before going to bed, you'll know how that impacts you the next morning. And so I, I think that that just gives us such powerful data that we can take to the bank and then really make real time changes that day. So to me, that is profound. And again, I do agree that we need to be an N of one. One of the things that I did last year was increase my protein intake. And what I saw, I have a history of cardiovascular disease in my family, big time um, diabetes as well. But my sister you know, was younger than me had a stroke um, last year. And so, you know, for me, it's, I've always been fiber focused and, you know, in order for me to step up my protein, my fiber had to step down and I run my labs every quarter. And what was fascinating when I really stepped up the protein and, you know, fiber kind of got bumped to the wayside a little bit, um, my lipids went up and my APOB went up and I was like, oh, Interesting. So that's, it's a really fascinating as an kind of an N of one to see how my body responded to more protein in my diet, really hitting my numbers. And what the big lesson for me was, is that fiber really needs to play a role that my microbiome would have preferred that my fiber, you know, the amount of fiber I was consuming every day had stayed the way it was. And so I brought back a lot of my, my cruciferous veggies, my chia seeds, my brought my, my smoothies back. Um, again, making sure I had 20 grams of protein in my smoothie and I ran my labs another three months and everything was pretty much back where it needed to be. And so, um, I just wanted to speak to that because I think that measuring whether we have CGMs or we're looking at labs a couple of times a year, as we're making these changes to our bodies, especially in midlife, you know, to be able to measure, not guess, um, I think is really profound and powerful. So that was a big lesson for me. That's so interesting. You know, for me, what I've found is my body is happiest with lean protein. So I don't do well with a fatty cut of steak, like a ribeye or duck or salmon. I do much better with lean protein Mm -hmm. and lots of vegetables. And I agree with you about the fiber. It's amazing. I think people unfortunately think of fiber just as, you know, inulin, psyllium husk, but you know, there's fiber. The powder you put in your smoothies and water. Right. So nasty. (laughs) Yes. No, I, I, I mean, try do what to, you got to do. Exactly. I think I just ate a cup of Brussels sprouts with my lunch. Yes. That was like, okay, you know, yeah. check the box. I've had a good amount. But I think for a lot of people, when you look at ultra processed food, so 70% of us eat ultra processed food predominantly in our diet. So we're not eating a food that has a lot of fiber in it and very likely a lot of seed oils and other things that are that are less than ideal. But I'm also a complete realist. And so 
There's nothing wrong with having a clean protein powder. There's nothing wrong with, you know, buying pre-packaged um, and cut up vegetables or fruit, um, you know, even pre-packaged cut up, you know, pieces of meat, things that just make our lives a little bit easier. But what is it about fiber that you feel is most beneficial when we're looking vis-a-vis -vis at the gut microbiome? Because I think some people perhaps aren't able to kind of make those connections about the role of pre and postbiotics and all these wonderful things that go on in the microbiome vis-a-vis -vis the foods that we choose to consume. Yeah. I mean, I think this is what you're probably learning a lot inside of your course right now regarding the microbiome. Like what we call them in my house, we call them tummy friends. Oh, <laughs> Because my so son's cute. always asking, okay, is this going to feed my tummy friends or my tummy friends going to love this? Um, you know, when, so I'm always pointing out to him, you know, the foods that our tummy friends, our microbiome love and in what's going to feed them and really replenish that. We obviously we have a diverse microbiome and, and um, there are definitely, you know, microbes in there that are more opportunistically driven than others. Um, but if we want, you know, you know, a happy mitochondria, good blood sugar balance, hormones that are well optimized, and even, you know, a great mood and brain that is working for us, you know, feeding the, our microbiome fiber rich foods. And I, I think about diverse fiber rich foods, foods that are pigmented with bright, gorgeous color, like that's what's going to move the needle in, in us. And then yes, if you don't feel like you're hitting your numbers, you want a little bit more, you know, add in the, um, the soluble and unsoluble fiber that you can get um, in powder form. But we sprinkle chia seeds on everything. We do basil seeds. I do, we just get really creative and make things really bright and beautiful and fun inside of our house. And, and I think that level of diversity is what's going to set us up. One of the things, one of the magic things that I love about, about fiber specifically outside of feeding the microbiome is how beautiful it stabilizes our blood sugar. It's one of the best ways that we can absolutely do that. And again, that has a lot to do with kind of slowing down that digestive process, allowing our microbiome to be fed with the right foods. And to me, there's just, I, to me, there's only so many side benefits to consuming fiber. And I think that we all inherently know that that plant are or should be a big part of our diet. And, you know, there's so many ways to get to enjoy those. Yeah, I love that. And it's interesting uh, in the midst of this course, because I the the one of the big takeaways is ferments. So yes, ferments. I yep. think <laughs> I think we as a culture like supplements. And the biggest takeaway from listening to all these experts in this course is that fermented foods, mm -hmm. however you decide to consume them, and and there's something new that I learned about. It's called it's like a fermented plum paste, and we'll link it up in the show notes. It's I have no affiliation with the company. You can get it on Amazon, but even having like half a teaspoon a day, it's it's one of those ways. It's like fertilizer for the gut microbiome. But whether or not it's fermented vegetables, if you tolerate dairy you know, like full fat, Greek yogurt, kefir, uh, miso, like actually the, mm -hmm. the female physician that was teaching was talking about miso. She has miso in her tea, like almost every evening. And it's just part of what she does to support the gut microbiome. So accessible, easy things that we can all be doing, get creative, you know, go to your um, farmer's market or go to your grocery store. I love Hex Ferments. Um, they're based out of North Carolina, but and they have really interesting flavor profile for fermented veggies. Like they have one that's got curry um, and fennel seed in it. That's really delicious. And every once in a while I, I run across, you know, it, it, a, a container of that can last me, I don't know, a couple months because no one else in my house eats sauerkraut, but me, but that's okay. That's okay. But when, when we're, <laughs> when we're thinking about strategies for navigating perimenopause into menopause, we've talked a little bit about macros. Uh, we've talked about continuous glucose monitors, wearables, things like that. Thinking about fiber. What are your thoughts about what is the most efficacious way to be exercising? So exercise mm -hmm. in and of itself is not what we do to lose weight. So I, I think that's, that's one, you know, um, yes. kind of reframe that I think mm -hmm. many of us have to kind of wrap our heads around what are some of the things that you do in terms of physical activity that you feel like are the biggest needle movers for you at this stage of your life? I would say the biggest, now I've come from a, 
I've come from years of exercise burnout. Um, I would say that exercise was probably the Achilles heel that really finally tipped me over for Hajimoto's thyroiditis. And so I have recovered from some pretty intense hit training classes over the years. And, but you know, what's important to me, and I think that's important to all of us is that I want to be able to not, not like put, I want to be able to throw my luggage into the overhead compartment at five foot two. I want to be able to pop up from the floor. I want to be able to pick up my sick three and a half year old off the floor if he just doesn't have the energy to do it and not even bat an eye. And so strength and um, yeah, strength is so, so critical to me. And so the thing that I prioritize, you know, three to four times a week is strength training and um, with progressive overload so that I'm getting stronger over time. But the other thing that I do, I really do feel like it's probably the magic bullet of magic bullets is walking. I walk so much. I walk in the sunshine as much as possible. I walk after dinner. I walk after lunch. I try to walk after breakfast. I I would say that I walk probably four to five times a day. Like if I have a 10 minute window between two meetings, I grab shoes and I'm out the door. That is what I'm doing. And I clock somewhere between 12 and 15,000 steps a day. And I, I'm not necessarily doing it for the metabolic aspect, more so for me, it's clearing my mind. It's a moment to myself. It's recalibrating my stress response system. It's telling my body that I'm safe. And it's something that I just get to do for me. And as a mom and, a, and an owner of a company, like it is, no one gets to mess with me. I'm so protective of my time. And, um, and walking is one of the most most beautiful ways that I do that. And so, and again, there's so many beautiful benefits. Like I, you know, I've worn a continuous glucose monitor on and off for almost three years now. And I will say that hands down, if I want to get my blood sugar back into optimal range, which for me is 70 milligrams per deciliter to 110 milligrams per deciliter girl, I'm looking for optimal. Okay. The walking is the ticket. So Mm -hmm. if you wanted to bank on longevity, I think for all women or all people listening, like that's the way to do it. And when you get to do it with family, you know, you get to connect in that way. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful way to boost that oxytocin and to get to kind of calm that nervous system energy. Yeah. And I love that you really emphasize you're doing this throughout your day. It's not mm-hmm. like you walked for three miles or four miles in the morning that you integrate this throughout your day and you've seen significant health benefits. Yeah. The one thing that I, I've really been disciplined about doing for the past year is wearing a weighted vest. Um, I know. I've only, I love I've only it. You started look good. <laughs> featuring it on social media because I kept saying I talk about it and I'm not showing people what I'm doing. And, you know, it was interesting. It was humbling because you put the weighted vest on and it's balanced. But it's, you know, I started with 10% of my body weight. And I remember saying to my husband, the first time I wore it, I could go about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I just felt like, oh my gosh, so much more weight on my frame. Having said that, I think it's so helpful to know that it gets my heart rate up into that zone, like solid zone too. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I do feel like the one thing I've really noticed is I've been hungrier. So to me, I kind of convey that I'm doing more benefit to my body. It's a little bit more hormesis or hormetic stress, Mm -hmm. but not in a negative way. It's not like I'm not recovering. And I 100% agree with you that I am really cognizant of getting on and off airplanes and lifting my own bag. And I'm sure there's lots of wonderfully chivalrous human beings out there who always graciously offer. And I always say, thank you, but no, thank you. I need to do this because one of the things that precedes muscle loss is strength strength. loss. And so that to me is something I want to avoid. The other thing that I have found to be beneficial is trying to balance on one leg. Mm, So balance work Mm -hmm. is important. Like my husband will sometimes look at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm putting on my shoe, I'm tying my shoe and I've got one leg, you know, bent and I'm doing it to balance. And I said, you know, it's balance is really important as we're getting older. It's not only telling our bodies where we are in terms of proprio reception, where we are in time and space, but also shows me where I need to do more work. Yeah. I do a lot of unilateral training. Yeah. I'm always testing one, one side of the body, either one leg or arms. So I'm doing, I do a lot of unilateral training and gosh, it is so, it is so humbling. I also brush my teeth with, um, I'm left-handed. So so I brush my teeth with my right hand. Um, and yeah, it's always, it's all very humbling. 
Um, I, I do. I love zone two training as well. I probably do it three times a week. It's not my favorite. I would much rather lift weights and just go for walks. Um, but I am, you know, I'm committed to my cardiovascular health. I do some sprint training too, you know, not as probably as often as I should, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and I've been wearing a weighted vest at all. I'm probably, I'm at 10 pounds. That's where I'm at right now. And, and that's working for me. And yeah, it is a very humbling experience, but um, it, it's such an easy such an easy thing to do to add to your, to your walking, um, your walking routine or, um, workout. Absolutely. And again, 10% of your body weight. So my husband bought me a 20 pound vest and I put it on and I was like, Ooh, it feels that's, a little heavy, yes, it's a little spicy. Heavy. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. <laughs> um, in terms of managing stress and addressing mm. sleep, what are some yeah. of your favorite ways to support both? Because stress is, part of Insidious. life. Insidious. Yeah. Right. And so and, I and think part that, of life. <laughs> yes. It, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know anyone who lives a stress-free lifestyle, no. but obviously healthy boundaries and yeah. finding ways to manage the stress that we do have that sometimes we have no control over. <laughs> mm. I would say that if you ask friends of mine, definitely, if you ask my husband, I am the boundary queen. And because I was boundaryless for so long. Um, so boundaries, I think, are super important. But I think boundaries even around how you live your life. And so I have, I have boundaries around my sleep. I fiercely protect my sleep like it's a million dollar meeting. And unless you are my million dollar meeting, like you cannot <laughs> interrupt, including my husband. I'm like, uh uh, like get out. So fiercely protecting my sleep. I kick off my sleep routine in the morning. Um, within, yeah, I try to be up before my family's up and family. I mean, my son, my toddler, um, and I'm outside in, in, well, it's sometimes it's gloomy. I'm on the coast. Um, but I'm outside in the sun or outside for at least five to 10 minutes, usually walking, just walking around, just up and down the street. I know I shouldn't go too far because my son's going to be looking for me pretty quickly. So that's one of the best ways I know to help to support my sleep. And then in the evening, and the other thing I do all day is I'm, like I said, like we talked about, I'm moving throughout the day. I am clearing that cortisol. I am making sure my body is good to go. We eat early because I know that our blood sugars benefit and it gives us an opportunity to walk as a family to the ocean. So we do that. So I usually have a three to four hour gap before that in bed. And then I kick off my bedtime routine after I get my son to sleep, which is he's in bed by eight o'clock. Um, I kick it off with my supplements and girl, I take supplements. I have my magnesium. I've got, um, I've got an, and kind of a, an, it's inflammatory by DFH. It's a wonderful kind of systemic enzyme with me with Haji's. I always want to make sure that I'm just gobbling up anything that's left over. That's residual. I take my progesterone in the second half of my cycle. Like I have a little. And so when I do my supplements that kickstarts my hour sleep routine that I am fierce about. And at that point, there is no stopping me from getting into my rhythm of sleep, which is reading and journaling low lights, making sure the bed is ready, that I'm cozy. I brush my, you know, you do all the things you do. And so that I'm in bed about an hour prior to actually going to sleep. And I am consistent every single day. So those are the things I do for sleep for stress. Um, there are a lot of ways that I, um, that I manage and support stress. I am, I have no problem admitting that I used to be addicted to stress. I used to think that it was my slight edge. And so I have, you know, recovered from a lot of being in survival mode, deregulated cortisol levels to the point where they were actually extremely low. And so I have learned that I have some deep, deeply embedded patterns that I'm still healing. Um, and I am very actively on that journey. And so in order to mitigate my kind of default patterning that, that likes to come on in all that, she's always just like, Hey, let's, let's be this way. And I'm like, okay, maybe that doesn't support me. Um, walking is a way that I mitigate listening to meditations, even walking meditations. Cause again, that little efficient version of me is always like, you know, you could do two things at the same time, you know? And so <laughs> walking meditations, reading, um, you know, breathing in sometimes breathing essential oils, doing breath work. Um, I'm, I'm really big into breath work either by myself or facilitated breath work. Um, I'm in, I'm in therapy with an internal family systems therapist, so there's lots of hugs and kisses from my son. Um, so there's just a lot of things that I do every single day to help mitigate 
what I call some deeper embedded patterns that can kind of drive me back into a survival based state. And I also do a lot of things that help me feel safe as well. So, you know, sending voice memos to dear friends and besties, seeing um, best friends in real life. I try to see best friends in real life every single week. So I just, I try to create kind of a safe bubble for my body, knowing that I'm in this perimenopausal continuum, knowing that my body is profoundly changing and knowing that I have a lot of responsibilities. I build in a lot of intentional rituals to manage and mitigate a lot of the stress that comes along with life. Well, I love that you have cultivated a really beautiful way of supporting yourself physically, emotionally, intellectually. And I know that we both share some childhood trauma yeah. and without unpacking too much. And I know you mentioned, you know, you you actively are working on boundaries and trauma. And, and if someone's listening and, you know, they have a high ACE score, like I've been very open that my ACE score is nine. And I'm always, I always jokingly say I will be in some form of therapy for the rest of my life because there's always something little that needs to be worked on. What have you found to be the most helpful resources if there's someone listening and really is ready to start doing that internal work? I know that we both have interviewed Dr. Sarah Gottfried and she has a wonderful book that came out earlier this year with lots of great resources. Yeah, it's what right are the here things on my that, desk. <laughs> yes. What are the things that you have found to be mm. most helpful to you and to your patients in this area specifically? Yeah. So I again I have yes, a lot of trauma, a lot of child abuse. Um I have an ACES score of a seven. So And, you know, and and trauma hits us in so many different ways. You don't even have to have an, you know, I think even an ACEs score of a three or a four is, is going to have a profound impact on your nervous system. Um, You know, and we hold trauma in our, in our body, in our fascia, in our cells. And, and it, in, in a lot of ways, like the stress response system, you know, we're dealing with lots of stressors, it is insidious and, and it has an impact on how we respond to stress, how we respond to life. And so that's something I'm always really mindful of the, the, what's really moved the needle for me has been a lot of somatic work. So again, the breath work, working with the somatic ther- like therapist to kind of move a lot of that trauma out of my system, working with someone like um, an internal family, you know, internal family systems therapist, you can really go in to find those, those hidden parts of you, those, those, those more, um, more precious, more, you know, you and I are both more, we're slayers, we just handle business. And so my, my protector self, it does a great job of, of protecting my smaller little self. And so really tapping into, you know, the deeper part of me, I've also done a lot of cranial sacral work that's connected into doing, you know, working in my subconscious, where I have some trap trauma as well. Um, I know Dr. Sarah Godfrey talks about, you know, plant medicine, as well as an opportunity to, to move through some of that stuck trauma and stuck energy. And again, to each their own in terms of their own journey. And then also, I believe that a lot of the trauma work that we get to do is really about the daily habits that we create for ourselves that keep us safe. And so because a lot of these other modalities I speak into, they do cost money. They they do require, you know, going and, and seeing somebody or working with someone. And I think it's a combination of a yes and like, yes, go and find somebody who can help really mediate some of that. I've done EMDR. I have done a bunch of, you know, energy work and all this types of trauma work. And I know that, you know, the things that I do daily are really going to set me up for success as well. So how am I going to tend to myself every single day? And some of those non-negotiables are clean water and really fueling my body with metabolically healthy foods are walking and watching the ocean are journaling are getting into my sauna and doing a meditation. And so I just have a lot of these built in. And I, I know you're thinking, well, you know, Marisa, Cynthia, how do you even have time for that? You guys are running this business, your moms, you're doing the things. And I promise you that if, if it's important to you, And you are, you know, you know that you need that support, you will, you will make the time. I, you know, I used, I used to think that, you know, working on myself at this way was, was more of a luxury that I didn't have time for, but that was my trauma. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was my trauma, the way that I thought about it. And it was just a major reframe that I deserve to heal my body, that I deserve to be loved, that I deserve to tend to my wounds, my worthiness wound, portrayal wound, trust wound, abandonment wound, whatever those wounds are. And I can integrate that into, into the work that I do, into who I am. And, um, and at the end of the day, guess what, girl, I get it all done, you know? And so it all, it, it all happened in, in a way it's, it's allowed me to reframe and repattern myself, um, into what really matters. And I think at the end of the day, no matter what our missions are, or who we tend to as, as, as women or as people, that life is really about savoring and it's joy and it's connection and it's spending time with the people that you love. And so I think those are the things that I've, I've really reframed in terms of what actually matters. And I know that tending to myself really opens the door for more of that. I think it's so important. And for everyone that's listening, we're all on different journeys. I know that it took me being a certain age before I was ready to do the work. And I have a really wonderful functional medicine doctor who I've been able to share a lot of these things that I went through as a child. And every once in a while, just very lovingly, he'll say, I think your trauma is talking. And then Mm -hmm. it helps me kind of find my way back. Like you are right. My reaction to X, Y, and Z is a byproduct of what I went through years ago. And this is something I need to work on. And I have found personally doing breath work for me has been life-changing. And that is something that is not a huge investment in time. And it's something that is free and accessible. And I I think for everyone listening, if you need to start somewhere, that might be a good place to start to help quiet that autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some supplements, uh, but I'm curious, what are your favorite supplements, like kind of loop back or conversation to the supplement piece? What are your favorite brain boosting supplements? I think a lot of people listening have expressed a desire to try things that help with brain health. Um, Obviously, foundationally, sleep, stress management, nutrition, exercise, all those things are foundational. You have to do the foundational stuff first. Don't go right to the supplements. But what are the supplements you have found other than hormone replacement therapy, which I'm sure we can talk about separately? I was going to say estradiol and progesterone, girl. exactly, exactly. (laughs) But if you were going to layer in something else for a patient that is otherwise, you know, Mm -hmm. doing the lifestyle stuff, you know, maybe they are or are not yet on hormone replacement therapy, what are some of your favorite brain supportive supplements? Absolutely. Well, as you know, I had a brain injury last summer um, to, to the degree that I couldn't shower, I couldn't drive my car, I couldn't even get my son ready in the morning, which is something I really love to do every morning to get to spend time with him. And there was, there was a dark moment there where I thought, oh my gosh, what if I don't recover? Cause sometimes people with oftentimes people with brain injuries, they, they, there's a part of them that just isn't there. Um, so it was, it was a very kind of scary time, but supplementing was so critical for me at that time I was, you know, on a, and so I just want to speak into kind of my little, my own kind of personal journey around that. And I will tell you that perimenopause, holy moly, you know, one of the, we talked about one of those, you know, kind of um, signs or kind of warning signs. I would say that more women come to me with a noticing that their brain has shifted. They, they have word recall issues. They've alertness issues. They're afraid that they're going to mess up a presentation. Um, they're not able to concentrate the, the way that they used to. So I think this is a major issue. And that's why we, you know, the little mini, the little mini thing around hormone replacement therapy was mentioned, but I'm a big fan, obviously of omegas. I'm a big fan of five milligrams of creatine every single day for brain boosting and, and, you know, metabolic support, muscle boosting. Um, I love, I mean, I think vitamin D is so critical probiotics, digestive enzymes. Again, the microbiome is so tied to your brain. Um, I also love green tea. I know it's not a supplement supplement, but I do matcha every single day. Matcha is beautiful for the microbiome, but also amazing for the brain. Um, I love mitochondrial support because at the end of the day, one of the hungriest, um, you know, energy consuming organs of the body is definitely the brain. And that's, that's mitochondrial function right there. So, um, I love acetyl L carnitine. I love, um, I love, you know, again, vitamin D I love B vitamins. I think that are absolutely critical. Um, and then I also love like glutathione, something that's going to really help support antioxidant support. So those are some of my kind of non-negotiable every single day, um, brain supplements that I love. 
No, I love that. And it's so kind of all encompassing. And I think a lot of people don't probably don't have a healthy enough amount of respect for vitamin D. And I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, you know, talking about how vitamin D is impacting immune function and blood sugar regulation, insulin sensitivity, but also understanding that it is a pro hormone. It is not just a vitamin. Um, And I think in many ways, it just doesn't get enough respect for sure. Now, when we're looking at supplements. I think this is an important thing to touch on. And and you had a blog article on this, which is why I was like, oh, I'm going to bring this up. We haven't probably talked about this, things to avoid in your supplements. So if you're listening and you are vetting a supplement in Whole Foods, Amazon, Costco, et cetera, there may be things in your supplement product that you don't want do you have some non-negotiables things that you think most people are unaware of or included in their supplements that they want to specifically try to avoid? Because ultimately, if you're going to take a supplement with the highest quality product that we can actually get our hands on, but also avoid, you know, things like gluten, you know, for many yeah, people, I was gonna they, say definitely yeah, gluten. gluten. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other things yeah. that we should look for to avoid when we're purchasing supplements? Also seed oils. Mm-hmm. I have been just shook by the amount of seed oils you'll find at your, you know, you'll find at Costco or target supplements. So be on the lookout for that. Steric acid, magnesium stearate, very common in about 90% of supplements, but can act as an immune suppressant, and you have slow digestion. Also formaldehyde risk can be within that. Um, obviously MSG, we want to avoid monosodium glutamate. Um, We know that that can be a neurotoxin and just super, super nasty. Um, Lactose and dairy can be in supplements as well. And so I know that um, both of us have dairy intolerances and many of us do. So again, looking at, you know, if, if there's dairy inside of your supplement, another one that I think is so fascinating that I see, especially because gummies are the thing right now, especially in kids is going to be sugar. So in the form of like sorbitol, corn syrup, and then artificial colors and artificial flavors, that's a, also a big part. Um, soy lectin, um, soybean oil, again, a seed oil, or just like, you know, the processed oil that's gross. Um, and then red dyes, some type, you know, a lot of them can be adverse, nasty dyes. So red number 33. Um, so be looking on the lookout for that. And then another one that I'm always being mindful of is titanium dioxide which makes pills and supplements really white. Um, and so it just can cause all kinds of, it's just a chemical that you don't want in your body. It, and it's linked to lung and respiratory tract cancers. And also it messes with our, our liver's ability to function. And so those are some of my big ones. Also parabens like methyl and propyl paraben, definitely not something you want because it's going to mess with the endocrine system. So those are some of my non-negotiables. Um, I think, you know, if you notice ingredients that just you can't pronounce it. You don't know what it is. Um, and the, you don't know a lot about the company. I always tell people, is it third party tested? You know, what are they saying about their quality? Um, you know, go and, you know, I know we buy a lot of our supplements from Amazon, but my recommendation is go directly to the source, the person who's selling it, the company that's selling it and do research on that company to make sure that the, that they are legit. That would be my recommendation. Those are some really good, um, recommendations and largely because you know unfortunately the supplement industry is a multi billion dollar a year industry in which i think there are some really nice pharmaceutical grade companies out there but there are just as many individuals Yucky. and companies that are completely the opposite and you may be consuming something that says one thing on the label and then when it gets tested it's completely the opposite like as an example i think there was a research article I was looking at, and it was looking at omega-3. So looking at omega-3 fatty acids, these are the anti-inflammatory healthy fats that you can get from certain types of seafood, et cetera. And they were sampling things that were found in a major store within the United States. And it said omega-3s and it was actually a bunch of seed oil. So as I always say, let the buyer beware. So to kind of round out the conversation today, Let's touch on a favorite subject of mine, because I think it has been so normalized in our culture and especially in women. When I'm working with women and we're doing an intake, when I'm talking to them about how often they go to the bathroom, whether or not they're constipated, 
why is it that we have normalized constipation and mm. yet it is such an important topic of conversation? I think we work in healthcare, so we're commonly having these discussions, but I have patients that are almost embarrassed to share. I only poop twice a week and I'm like, okay, that's something we need to work on. But why it's so important in particular in this middle age stage of our lives when we're looking to be able to detoxify and yes, detoxification is a natural process in our bodies, but we want to do as much as we can to support it and why being constipated is ultimately problematic for our health. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing. You know, there's a lot of things that we normalize for yep. women. <laughs> Constipation being one of those. And I believe that if you are not having a bowel movement every single day, at least one, you are not able, you're not detoxifying. We're not, we're not moving it out. And you know, that's when we got to really look at how our gut and our liver is functioning. But we know that if we are, we are not moving things out of our large intestine, we're not, you know, moving the, that bowel out, that we are just recirculating, recirculating excess estrogen metabolites, other hormonal metabolites, toxins, and that just that just puts a even greater burden on our liver and our gut. And yes, this is definitely an area um, that I think, again, we don't talk enough about, obviously, and I wouldn't call it taboo by any means. It's just not something that anyone wants to talk about. Now, if you're a parent to a young child, poop is the conversation all day long. So it's something I'm always talking about in my household. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the first areas. Not only am I asking women about their, their cycle, or especially if they're in perimenopause and menopause, what's going on with their hormones, their energy levels, their mitochondrial health, their blood sugar, but also, you know, what is the status of their bowel movements. Like how is that going? And I would say eight out of 10 women are not having bowel movements every single day. Yeah. I think it's, it's fascinating to me that not only is there, even as healthcare providers, sometimes we're not asking those questions and sometimes it can be totally benign. Like you're not hydrated. You're not moving enough during the day. Not enough fiber and fermented not enough veggies. Fiber, or people need things like a squatty potty, like mm -hmm. something that's so, it just lifts your feet up. And for some people anatomically, they just need that degree of support. And so I've come to find there's a whole milieu of things starting from fresh ground flax and chia seeds mm -hmm. all the way up to stimulants that we will sometimes utilize to get things moving. Well, I could talk to you for hours, but I would love for my listeners to figure out how they can reach out to you on social media, get access to your books, your amazing podcast, or which I've been a guest on twice. How can they connect with you and learn more about your work? Absolutely. So on Insta, which is one of my favorite places to play, it's at Dr. Marisa, D-R-M-A-R-I-Z-A. -A. The podcast is called Energize with Dr. Marisa. And yes, I just had you on and it was so much fun. And then my books are on Amazon that you can find them there. Um, so yeah, those are my, those will be the places that I love to connect with people the most. Awesome. Thank you so much, my friend. Hey, if you like this video, you guys are going to love this video and I'll see you there conversation I'd love to have with every 35 year old woman is that once 40 hits your ovaries are gonna are gonna be done and they're gonna slowly it's not like it's done overnight they're gonna slowly decline it's gonna take 10 to 15 years for these ovaries to be out but you literally have an organ that is done doing its job It'd be like if your like heart was like, hey, I'm done. I'm just going to slowly <laughs> like this. I don't understand why we don't talk about this. Right.